Okay, we should be recording now. Um, I am going to uh, finish up lecturing about tissues, uh, chapter four in your textbook, and hopefully we'll get to conclusion there. Um, I'll start where we left off. Just to uh, reiterate, there are four main tissue types in the human body. Those are epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscular tissue, and nervous tissue. So all tissues in the human body are one of those four types. We finished the epithelials and we just started to talk about connective tissue and I'm gonna continue with that. So let me share my screen, go to a whiteboard. So this is connective tissue continued. Um, when I write connective tissue from this point on, I'm just gonna write CT to save us some time from me having to write out the word connective tissue or the term connective tissue all the time. We already said a few things about connective tissue. So I'm gonna repeat those right now. First, it's connective tissue is the most abundant type of tissue in the human body. Of those four types, those four main types, connective tissue is by far the most abundant and the most varied as well. There are four main classes of connective tissues. We went over these at our last lecture. There's connective tissue proper, there's cartilage, there's bone and fluid connective tissue. We also mentioned some common characteristics of connective tissue, of all connective tissues. The common characteristics are they have a common origin and that means a common embryonic origin. So the, the embryonic precursor tissue for all connective tissues is the same and that is called mesenchyme. All connective tissues also have a varying degree of vascularity. Just, just, that just means that some connective tissues are very rich in a blood supply. Other connective tissues have very little to almost no vascularization or blood supply whatsoever. And finally, all connective tissues, some component of them is a non-living matrix. So that's where I'm gonna start. Are the structural elements in connective tissue are made up, all connective tissues are made up of living cells, which, which is the living component, and a non-living matrix. Okay. That non-living matrix is composed of a ground substance, and fibers. So a ground substance is really some kind of unstructured material. It can be fluid, it can be gel-like, it can be very hard. Um, and fibers are just a fibrous material, non-living non fibrous material secreted by living cells. So the living cells, this is in general how this works. The blast form of a cell, B-L-A-S-T, what that means is an immature cell. It's usually a suffix. So um, for example, a chondroblast is an immature cartilage cell. An osteoblast is an immature bone cell. A fibroblast is an immature cell that secretes fibers. So whenever you see the word blast at the end of, of a term, it refers to an immature cell. And the blast form of a cell typically secretes these non-living things, okay? When that blast, that immature cell stops secreting, it then matures into a mature cell, which is designated as the, with the suffix site. So I'm gonna write mature cell and it no longer secretes. So just think young cells, which are called blasts, they secrete this stuff over here. And then when they stop secreting, they become mature cells. Uh, their term, their title ends with the word site. So once again, a chondroblast 
is an immature cartilage cell and it secretes ground substance and fibers. A chondrocyte is a mature cartilage cell that no longer secretes, it just maintains the matrix. An osteoblast is an immature bone cell. An osteocyte is a mature bone cell. So you get that picture. Of the fibers that are secreted by immature blast cells, there are three main types of fibers in connective tissue. So I'm just gonna write types. We'll list them as one, two, and three. I'll go in the order of your book. First one, I believe this is the same order as your book, collagen fibers. So get their name because they, they secrete fibers that are rich in the protein collagen. Collagen is, an, collagen is an extremely tough fibrous protein. So it gives collagen fibers extreme strength. As a matter of fact, they're even stronger than, than steel, um, mass for mass or pound for pound. So collagen fibers, are somewhat inflexible, but extremely strong. They give connective tissue its strength. Elastic fibers are not quite as, not, not as strong as collagen fibers, but they're rich in the, in the protein elastin, which gives these fibers um, their ability to stretch kind of like a rubber band and recoil, snap back in to original shape. And finally, the third type of fiber are reticular fibers. Reticular fibers are kind of between in description and characteristic. They're kind of between number one and two. They do have some collagen, but they're not quite as strong as collagen fibers. They have some collagen protein, but they're also flexible. So they're kind of a, a mediator between numbers one and two. So those are the three major types of fibers that we find in connective tissue. Let's layer over to another board and look at the types of living cells. We already established what blast and sight means and that blast and mature cells secrete uh, the ground substance and the fibers to make up that non-living matrix. <clears throat> now we're going to look at types of, of actual living cells we find typically in connective tissue. I'll just make a laundry list and describe to you what each of these cells basically, basically do. So <clears throat> oftentimes we find fat cells or lipid cells in connective tissue. Adipose tissue, which I'll describe later, is full of these cells. Um, those, are for, those produce energy reserves as well as insulation. There are also things called mast cells, which are immune type of cells that um, secrete histamines and they mediate the inflammatory response. So mast cells mediate inflammation by, by releasing histamines, which are chemicals that, that cause vasodilation. <clears throat> um, we also have macrophages, very important. Macrophages are a nonspecific immune cell and what they do is they engulf or devour foreign microorganisms. So macrophages, I'm just gonna list, they are, they, it's called, they're phagocytic cells. They phagocytize foreign, I'm just gonna put cells, but really all, all types of foreign um, microorganisms and debris. <clears throat> Now let's just uh, examine connective tissue types. So just like we did with epithelial, I'm gonna give you a list, an outline, a laundry list of different types of connective tissues. This is where things get a little bit challenging because there's so many of them 
and they're lumped into um, a quite complex outline or organization format. So last time we listed that the, the four major types of connective tissue are connective tissue proper, cartilage bone, and fluid. So let's just do this. I'm gonna write connective tissue proper the first main category of CT, of connective tissue. Within connective tissue proper, we have, I'll put a one here. We have loose connective tissue, I'm gonna write loose CT. And there's three subcategories of loose connective tissue. This is what I meant by it gets quite complicated. So let's do a little number one. I'll go in the order of your book. Areolar connective tissue. We'll do the same thing. We'll talk about the locations of these connective tissues and their functions. <clears throat> so let's just do location first. This is the most widely dispersed of all connective tissues. So it's found all over the body in the deep layers of the skin we find this, as well as around organs and vessels. It's made, of, it's like this sort of, when you look at it under a microscope, it's made of, you can see these fibers in this sort of mass of ground substance and the living cells are interspersed like this. It kind of looks like a bird's nest with um, little eggs or cells in them. That's kind of what it looks like. It's functions, and it has several. Basically that it supports and binds other tissues. So I'm just gonna write supports, binds. It also, we say it has an immune function because immune cells tend to hang out in this type of of tissue as well. So it defends infection. Second type of loose connective tissue is adipose tissue. Just think fat. So fat tissue on our bodies is scientifically called adipose tissue. It's also widely distributed throughout the body. So locations, it's actually located under the skin, not within deep layers of the skin, but even deeper to that. So it's under the skin, also around our organs for protection, especially our vital organs. <clears throat> and its main functions, I'm just gonna list a few, are energy reserve, stores energy, it cushions things from damage, from physical trauma. It also insulates, helps keep body temperature warm. I'm gonna put number three on the next page. Just so you know, adipose tissue kind of looks like this. The cells are big, they're just filled with a fat droplet. And we see the cells get distended because of that big lipid droplet in them. And the nucleus usually gets pushed over all the way out to the side of the cell like this. So that's, that's what adipose tissue looks like. And the third one within the loose CT category, go to my next page and write number three, is reticular connective tissue. Reticular connective tissue gets its name because it's rich in reticular fibers. <clears throat> Location, I'm gonna write soft organs, specifically things like the spleen, lymph nodes, somewhat in the liver as well. 
uh, its functions are internal framework or support. Let me get my eraser here. So functions. Internal support. That's why soft organs like the spleen and lymph nodes don't just fall apart into pieces. Are those reticular fibers provide an internal framework for those organs? <clears throat> so that takes care of. I'm just going to go back to the previous page. We've taken care of loose connective tissues, areolar, adipose, and reticular. Now the second category, so I'm going to put a capital letter B out here, are dense connective tissues. So I'm write dense CT. And there's three types of dense connective tissue. <clears throat> Number one, I'm going in the order of your book, is called dense regular connective tissue. It gets its name because the fibers are regularly arranged. That means we see these fibers, they're not all perfectly straight, but they're almost always parallel to each other like this. Hence the name regular. The locations, this stuff is found mostly in tendons and ligaments. I know you've all heard of tendons and ligaments. If you're not sure of the difference between the two, tendons bind muscle to bone. They're connections of muscle to bone. Ligaments bind bone to bone. So it's a bone to bone connection. Functions are just connect and bind as we've just expressed. Second type of dense connective tissue is dense irregular. connective tissue. It gets its name from how it looks as well. Rather than these nice, perfectly parallel fibers, dense irregular connective tissue almost looks like a jumbled mass. It's very disorganized looking. When we look at this tissue under a microscope, it kind of looks like this. I always, when you look at it, because it stains red, it picks up a red stain, it almost looks like a chunk of raw meat or something to me. And we find this tissue in the deepest layer of the skin locations. I'm going to put deep dermis. That's the deepest layer of the skin. That's where we find most of it. It has many functions. It binds and connects other tissue layers above and below. It also provides vascularization. It's highly vascular, rich blood supply. It also helps somewhat connect muscle to bone as well, but um, it can cushion, so it gives the, our skin, the deepest layer of our skin, it, when you get poked or jabbed very, uh, very intensely, this, it's, it's a very thick layer, this tissue, and it helps cushion as well. So I'm just gonna add that cushion. And so that's one, two. The third one I'm gonna write on the next page. The third dense connective tissue <clears throat> is called elastic connective tissue. And it's because it's filled with elastic fibers that have the protein elastin in them. <clears throat> A location, the main location, I'm just going to give you one, the walls of vessels. In our arteries and veins, we find a lot of this type of tissue because the function is to stretch and recoil. And that makes sense. 
that we find a lot of this stuff uh, in our vessels because when the heart pumps blood, a surge of blood goes through our arteries and they have to expand to accommodate that surge of pumped blood. And then after that surge travels downstream, they recoil or snap, our vessels recoil or snap back <clears throat> into original diameter and shape. <clears throat> okay, I'm just a quick repeat because we're finished with, we've done uh, connective tissue proper. First, this is just the main categories of connective tissue. We've got connective tissue proper. The subcategories are loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue. And there's three main tissues in each one. So try to keep this, it's difficult, but try to keep it organized. So far we've done six tissues, one, two, three loose, and one, two, three, which I did on the next page, three dense. <clears throat> now let us go to cartilage. So we've we're finished with connective tissue proper. That was big number one. So this is big number two, cartilage. Remember there's four subcategories of connective tissue. Loose connective tissue, sorry, connective tissue proper, cartilage, bone, and fluid. So let's do cartilage. <clears throat> There's three types of cartilage in the human body. I'm gonna give you some general characteristics of cartilage. It's, it's a strong material, but you know, we all know what cartilage is because the tip of our nose we felt before, our ears we have felt. Um, it's tough, but very, but somewhat flexible, way more flexible than bone. Um, it's kind of between dense connect, connective tissue and bone somewhere in terms of its flexibility and toughness. This stuff is extremely avascular, has very little to no blood supply, direct blood supply. The matrix, the non-living portion of this contains chondroitin sulfate. and hyaluronic acid. It also uh, is made up of about 80% mm, of water. That really gives it its fluidity or flexibility. Um, immature cartilage cells, I mentioned this earlier, are called chondroblasts. Those secrete the non-living matrix. A chondrocyte would be a mature cell that no longer secretes stuff. <clears throat> All right, let's go into the three types of cartilage. I'll just list, list them as A, B, and C. Hyaline cartilage is the most common an abundant type of cartilage in the human body. This look, I'll give you, I'll give you a list of locations. I'll try to be specific when in my descriptions. Locate locations we find this stuff on the tip of the nose, the ends of bones, particularly long bones where they articulate at joints, um, the ends of ribs, where our ribs connect to the sternum is, there's a connection of hyaline cartilage and the trachea, the windpipe is lined with rings of cartilage. So those, those are the main sources um, of where we find hyaline cartilage. It's extremely strong most abundant, its main function or functions is structure 
articulation and connects. So for example, the tip of the nose, it gives the end of our nose structure. It covers the ends of our long bones to provide articulation, a smooth surface for other bones to ride on at the joint. Uh, it connects our ribs to the sternum and the trachea is also supplied structure by those hyaline cartilage rings. It helps keep our trachea open for airflow. All right, I'll go on to the next page, second type of cartilage, so we'll write B. I'll go in the order of your book here. Elastic cartilage is next. I'm gonna write elastic cartilage. Make sure you don't get this. It's easy to get it confused with elastic connective tissue that we've already done. So I'm gonna write not elastic connective tissue. Remember elastic connective tissue is a stretchy material that we find in our vessels. Elastic cartilage is a different material and the locations they both have the names elastic in them because they contain elastic fibers. The locations of elastic cartilage are the outer ear. So what you and I call the ear, you can grab it on the outside of your head, is typically only part of that organ. But the outer ear, if you pull your ear forward and bend it and then let go, it snaps back into position because it's full of this type of cartilage. Also the epiglottis, which is a flap of cartilage that covers the opening to our trachea when we swallow food. So really quickly, I'll draw you a picture over here. This is a lateral view, a side view. If this is the opening of the trachea, here's the windpipe and it's ridged like this because it has hyaline cartilage rings in the trachea holding it open. But there's a, a flap of elastic cartilage like this, that's open all the time, unless we swallow. The swallowing mechanism of food closes this epiglottis to close off this opening so that food doesn't go down our windpipe. It gets forced back here and goes down our esophagus. So functions, I'm gonna write structure and recoil. I think the ear gives it structure and the ability to recoil. So we've done hyaline cartilage, cartilage, elastic cartilage. Now let's do the last one, which is fibro cartilage. Gets its name because you can see the fibers in, in the cartilage itself. <clears throat> Fibrocartilage locations are pretty specific. The discs between our vertebrae, they're called intervertebral discs. You've heard of people uh, in their spines or their vertebrae, there's discs back there. They're actually these pads of fibrocartilage. We also find it in the knee joint, there's a huge pad called the knee meniscus. Those are the two main places that we find fibrocartilage. It can be found um, sparingly in the, in the um, temporomandibular joint. We find a little bit of fibrocartilage there as well. There's a meniscus. But these are the two main ones, the intervertebral discs and the meniscus. Its main function is shock absorption. And some cushioning as well. So that takes care of all the cartilages. So we've done um, connective tissue propers, loose and dense. We've done all three cartilages. And now I'm gonna go on to bone. Let me go back for a second, just, I, I wanna be consistent. So I wrote a big number one for connective tissue proper, a big number two for cartilage. 
So I'm going to write a big number three for bone. And we're still we're still in just the the realm of connective tissues. Bone. <clears throat> There's two major types of bone, but before we uh, get into that, I'm going to give you some general characteristics. Bone basically is for support, uh, connection, protection. And the synthesis of blood cells. It's the site of where our blood cells are made. <clears throat> There's also some storage. I'm going to put storage of minerals it's where most of our calcium is stored, as well as some fat. Those are some general functions, categorical functions um, of just bone itself. Remember a bone, a, a mature bone cell is called an osteocyte. An immature bone cell is an osteoblast. And it's this blast form, immature form, that secretes ground substance. That non-living ground substance <clears throat> that combines with calcium and it forms that hard calcified material to make up the matrix. <clears throat> there are two main types of bone. So let me just list A and B. We have compact bone, which is the stuff you and I think of when we hear the word bone, that is the hard dense material we find it the locations are the shaft of long bones where we find most of it as well as the outer covering of most bones as well we'll talk all about the details of bone tissue how it grows how it repairs uh, when we get when we do the skeletal system. Second type of bone tissue is called spongy bone. S-P-O-N-G-Y. That gets its name based on what it looks like under a microscope. Um, under a microscope, you see this, this surface that looks like it has holes um, cut in it. Those aren't really holes. Those are a cross sections of trabeculae, of little bone needle spicules. Here's what spo spongy bone kind of looks like. In a typical long bone, the shaft of a long bone, other than this hollow cavity in the middle, which is called the medullary cavity, that's filled with fat in adults. I'll redraw this in detail when we get to the skeletal system, but compact bone is found in the wall right here, this thick, dense material. It also, we find compact bone, just a thin covering of it on the end of the long bone. So it sort of does this. Inside of the end of the long bone are these little bone needles or spicules. They're like little mini struts and it's not hollow in there. It's not a hollow space or an air space. The little needles that I'm drawing are actual bone material. And there's a gel-like material called bone marrow found between these little bone needles or spicules. So the red is marrow and the black lines are, they're called, technically they're called trabeculi, but they're little bone spicules. Together we call this stuff spongy bone and this is the locations are you already know the ends of long bones as i've drawn it as well as the center of flat bones not all flat bones but most 
have some spongy bone in there. And that red marrow, so the main function of spongy bone is it's the site of blood cell synthesis. Where our red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets are manufactured. Site of blood, I meant to say blood cell synthesis. And that's all we're going to say for bone, about bone for now. Um, we'll get in greater detail when we study the skeletal system. So now we're on to the last type of connective tissue, which is fluid. So this is a big number four. Fluid connective tissue is basically blood and lymph. Not going to talk much about lymph. Uh, you'll learn all about lymph fluid uh, when you study the immune system and the lymphatic system. Um, and at this college, I think that's an AMP too. I teach both one and two. The different, uh, you know, I also teach at Rowan University and at, at that school. Um, I can't remember if the lymphatic system is an AMP one or two. Nevertheless, blood <clears throat> is made up of living cells. So, red blood cells, I'm just gonna describe it. White blood cells, These, this is the living component. Something called thrombocytes or platelets. Non-living portion of blood matrix is blood plasma. So the, the constituents or the, the physical characteristics of blood, we have these living cells. There's some red blood cells and some white blood cells. And they're suspended in this light amber like material, this fluid called plasma. And that's the physical characteristics. Now, even though plasma is a fluid, um, where are the fibers? Well, it's kind of a, um, a unique, unique thing. The fibers are dissolved in normal situations. Um, and it's only when we start to bleed that the fibers come out of solution to block uh, the bleeding site, the wound, in order to stop the bleeding. It's a life-saving mechanism. So even though we can't really see the fibers in plasma, they're dissolved in there. And there's a chemical reaction that occurs when we start to bleed. It's called hemostasis, that, that these fibers come out of solution. Um, it's an enzymatic reaction. Um, so the main, let me just write down the main function of blood is transportation. The list is long. Blood, its main function is to transport all sorts of things. Oxygen, CO2, nutrients, hormones, electrolytes, waste products, proteins, uh, all sorts of things. There's over a hundred uh, constituents dissolved in plasma. <clears throat> so we are now finished with connective tissue, which is a good thing. We're gonna do just to to remind you now, the main four main tissue types. You know that I think this is important why I keep repeating it. Because I know can, this can get confusing. Epithelial tissue, cover and line surfaces, we finish those. Connective tissue, connect, bind, do all sorts of things, have immune function, store energy, yada, yada, yada. We finished all of those. And the last two main tissues in the human body are muscular tissue and nervous tissue. I'm just gonna mention a few fun facts about these two. We did these two in detail because we're not gonna revisit them really for the rest of the semester. We are gonna study the muscular system and the nervous system in great detail. So let's, I'm just gonna mention a few things about each and that'll be it for chapter four. I'm gonna mention tissue repair. So muscular tissue, I would like you to remember there are three main types of muscular tissue. 
Those are skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is what you and I think of when we hear the word muscle. It's attached to bones. The cells are striated. That means they have stripes when we look at them under a microscope. Contractions are voluntary. That means we have conscious control over, you wanna move your arm, you can move your arm. Um, contract, that's called voluntary control. And the cells are multi, the individual cells are multinucleate. Each cell has more than one nucleus. I'll tell you why when we get to the muscular system. Second type of muscular tissue is cardiac muscle. It's only found in the heart. Cells are also striated and branched. Contractions are involuntary. That means we do not have conscious control over the contractions. You can't just think you want to speed up your heart rate and it does it or slow it down. So contractions are involuntary, don't have conscious control. And the cells, you typically have one to two nuclei per cell. So they are, they can have more than one nucleus, but not nearly as many as skeletal muscles. I'm just gonna write per cell. And last but not least is smooth muscle. Oh, by the way, these have striations as well. The cells are striated. Oh, I already said that. Um, smooth muscle, the cells are not striated. That's where it gets its name. But we find the location, I'll be consistent, are it lines, organ, walls, and vessels. So we find this type of muscle in the walls of things like our intestines, our stomach, our esophagus, uh, as well as lining in the walls of our arteries and veins. Cells are not striated. That's where it gets its name smooth. It's also involuntarily controlled. The contractions are involuntary. And one nucleus per cell. They are not multinucleate. All right, let's do a little bit about nervous tissue. Last major category of tissues is nervous. Main locations of nervous tissue are the brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nerves that run off of to and from the spinal cord into our appendages and our trunk. <clears throat> so that's the main locations of this tissue. Um, there are basically two cell types, two cell categories, I'm the right types, of, in nervous tissue. Neurons, these are the cells that conduct electrical impulses. They're the money cells. We'll learn all about how they do that when we study the nervous system. And the second category are called neuroglia. There's several different types of neuroglia, but as a whole, these are non-conducting helper cells. And you'll learn about what they do when we study the nervous system as well. I want you to know the language. 
So you need to know that nervous tissue is found in the brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nerve. There are two cell types, neurons. They conduct electrical impulses. Neuroglia are basically helper cells that do not contact, conduct electrical impulses. Neural tissue is highly, my, uh, highly the metabolism is, is extremely high. So I'm gonna write high cellular metabolism. You already took bio once, so you should know that mitochondria Typically, where cells um, use oxygen and an energy source to make ATP, uh, neural cells, neurons are very high in uh, mitochondria and they have a high rate, cellular metabolism rate. They are also amitotic. That means they don't divide. Once we're born with our nerve cells, pretty much we, we have them for life. Once they die or get damaged, we don't make new ones typically. <clears throat> Therefore, they have very long lifespans, the cells. Cells. All right, I'm gonna leave it at that with nervous tissue. Uh, briefly, I'm gonna talk about, last thing I'm gonna talk about is we call it the new whiteboard. Last topic of conversation is going to be tissue repair. <clears throat> Basically two methods that tissue can use to repair once it's damaged. And the method that is used completely depends upon the severity of the injury or damage, as well as the type of tissue that was injured or damaged. And I'll go into that, but I'm just gonna write two methods of repair and they are called regeneration. When you see this word or you think of this word, think of replacing the old damaged tissue with the exact same type of tissue or new tissue. So it replaces the original tissue with the exact same type of tissue. That's different than fibrosis. In this type of tissue repair, we get fibrous connective tissue or scar tissue forms in the place of the old tissue. It's not exactly the same. And which type of tissue base or which type of repair depends on two things. So I'm just going to write repair depends on type of tissue damaged and the severity of the injury. Now there's steps to repair, typical steps to tissue repair. And I'm just gonna list them as one, two, three. The first thing that always happens when tissue gets damaged is we get inflammation. It's a non-specific immune response. It's also a, a, an automatic response to damaged tissue. So inflammation always occurs first. And damaged tissue typically releases some sort of chemical that causes that inflammatory process. It also signals macrophages and mast cells to sort of kick into gear. Remember mast cells release histamine, that increases inflammation. Macrophages are phagocytic. What they do is they devour dead tissue or any infection that comes into the area. So during inflammation, um, we first get uh, an inflammatory response set off by chemical release. And then <clears throat> we get uh, blood clotting or hemostasis occurs after that. So any blood loss that's occurring, hemostasis walls off the area. <clears throat> and then organization begins. After inflammation, we get, I'm gonna write number two, organization. In this process, 
it's it's basically um, the beginning, the very beginning of the repair process. During organization, um, that blood clot that is formed is replaced by something called granular tissue. We all have had damaged tissue on our skin and that soft, delicate pink tissue that replaces say a blood clot or a scab is, is actually called granular tissue. So that appears after the blood clot is removed and it tends to contain new capillary vascularization. It, can, it contains new capillary beds and that's what gives the tissue its sort of granular appearance. Fibroblasts, which means an immature cell that secretes fibers, Fibroblasts in the new tissue release growth factors. Those are chemicals. They're hormone-like chemicals. They also secrete um, collagen fibers. To help with the repair. Granular tissue becomes scar tissue, um, a highly fibrous uh, type of scar tissue, which is highly resistant to infection. So scar tissue um, has its positive and negatives. It's, it's a sort of quick type of, of organization and repair. It's also highly resistant to infection. Um, the, the downside of scar tissue is it's less functional and it's not as aesthetic, of course, <clears throat> Finally, the last step, which I'm going to just call up a new board here, number three, is regeneration. This is where either regeneration and or fibrosis occurs. Step three, almost all injuries include both processes, both types of repair. We know what regeneration means. It means replacing the old damaged tissue with the exact same new tissue. Fibrosis means replacing the old damaged tissue with scar tissue or highly fibrous tissue. How much of this goes on as opposed to this and vice versa depends on the type of tissue and the severity of injury. <clears throat> So in simple infections, like if we just get a simple skin infection, something like that, usually only regeneration, almost all regeneration occurs. Only severe infections or severe injury call up a whole lot of scar tissue or fibrosis to occur. Here's the last topic of the day. I'm gonna categorize the tissues that you've just learned in the human body and categorize them based on how regenerative or not regenerative they are. So I'm gonna make categories. I'm gonna write high regeneration. And I'm gonna list the tissue types in the human body that have a high capacity to regenerate once they're damaged. Epithelial tissue is highly regenerative. That makes sense. Uh, it covers entrances and exits to the body as well as it covers our entire body in the form of our integument, our skin. It's highly regenerative. You know that you get a scrape, especially when, when you're young, it heals almost invisibly to new tissue. So epithelial tissue, bone tissue is highly regenerative. It has lots of blood supply and it, it repairs very well. Uh, areolar connective tissue is highly regenerative. So we write areolar CT. <clears throat> Dense irregular CT, that stuff that we find deep in the dermis, is highly regenerative. All of these are highly vascular, vascularized tissues. They have rich blood supplies, which contributes to their ability to repair. And finally, um, blood forming tissue, that's spongy bone. is also highly regenerative. <clears throat> 
next category list, I'm gonna, I think these are the same terms your book use, I'm pretty sure, moderate. So moderate regeneration capabilities would be things like smooth muscle, dense, regular, Remember, dense regular things like tendons and ligaments. <clears throat> Next category is weak. That means not great repair at all, but some minimal repair occurs. Skeletal muscle, which is unusual because skeletal muscle is generally highly vascularized, but skeletal muscle, the stuff that's attached to our bones that you and I think of when we hear the word muscle, does not have great uh, regeneration capabilities. <clears throat> Cartilage, very weak in regeneration. And finally, none. Cardiac muscle, once it's damaged, it's pretty much gone for good. And central nervous system tissue, brain and spinal cord. You've probably heard the expression, once you lose brain cells, you're not getting them back. That's pretty much true. All right, guys, I'm going to cut it there. I believe that's the end of chapter four. Let me cut off my recording. <clears throat>